Hey everyone, Michelle Lim here. Very happy to be here. Today we're going to be covering some more um, chapters of Mastering Stand Up. Today we're going to be talking about insult comedy, self deprecating humor, and crowd work. Um, crowd work is one of my favorite things to talk about because I'm not very good at it. So I love learning about how people do successful crowd work because it's just so good when they do. And I'm a very good conversationalist in real life. It just so happens that I'm not very good when I'm on a stage trying to talk to someone, but I think I've learned a couple of tips and then I'm excited to share them with you as well. So to start out, shout out to my new subscriber, Tob Chu. Thank you so much for subscribing. Um, um, I read a lot of the book uh, over the last week because I had to go to San Jose for work. So uh, I'm going to be doing two topics to, or two videos today, one on insult comedy and the other one on a couple of different styles of stand-up comedy as well. Um, so to start off with insult comedy, um, last week we covered off a couple of different types of put down humor. So put down humor for celebrities, put down humor for people in your life, and put down humor for hecklers. Now insult, insult comedy is different from put down humor because you're kind of targeting people in the audience who are just innocent bystanders, man. They didn't do anything wrong and it's probably an audience person's worst nightmare is to get kind of picked on by the comic. But the difference is with successful insult comedy, you want to really make sure that um, you know, the audience members that you're conversing with know that it's just all fun and games, like you you have no like malicious intent and it's just kind of like for the sake of the show. So you have to be really careful when you do insult comedy just to make sure that the audience um, member know that, knows that it's not personal. So um, Stephen in his book writes that insult comedy is it's aimed at non -heck or it's aimed at non hecklers in the audience um, and you have to be very clear that there's no hard feelings behind the jokes. Um, and he goes in a little bit further to say, um, he says, successful put down comedians, um, they ignore the guideline where, you know, a lot, a lot of the time people say, well, if you're Asian, you can talk about Asian people, or if you're Jewish, you can make fun of Jewish people, or if you're gay, you can make fun of gay people. Successful put down comedians ignore this guideline and they put down everyone, right? So they get away with it because the jokes are never personal. So if there was an Asian member in um, your audience and they had a disability, you would never make fun of the disability. You would only make fun of like impersonal Asian stereotypes. Um, and the only people that you would put down for their looks would be people that are very good looking so that they know that you are, um, you're, you're just joking about it and it's not like a personal attack. So, um, so he goes on to say that insult comedians actually stand up for democracy by affirming that everybody no matter their race, sex, creed, or color, has something wrong with them. And I think that's something that we want to keep in mind. You're not trying to attack someone personally. You're saying like, hey, you've got flaws, I've got flaws, everybody has flaws, let's laugh about it, but let's do it in a way that brings people together and acknowledging that no one's perfect as opposed to like tearing someone down and making them feel bad about them having these, um, you know, flaws. So um, he says, it's this democratic spirit of insult comedians that makes them funny. It would be disastrous for an insult comedian to single out one group of people to ridicule. That would be bigotry, and bigotry is not funny. Um, so then he goes on to say, you have to make it really clear that the audience person that you're picking on hasn't done anything wrong, right? So the only prerequisite for being on the receiving end of... Um, um, Mason's insult. So Mason is Jackie Mason, who's a an, an insult comedian who does a lot of this insult humor. So we recommend you look him up, Jackie Mason, um, if you haven't done so already. And he says the only prerequisite for being on the receiving end of a Mason insult is the obviousness of your innocence. So um, yeah. So basically, to sum it up, he says insult comedy works effectively with other forms of stand up or as an entire act. When they are delivered in the context that includes the following. So one, it has to have a sense of warmth and fun from the comedian as opposed to anger and hostility. Two, it has to have a democratic spirit of the joke. So you have to send the message that there's something wrong with everyone and not just one or a few. And three, the jokes can't be personal or hurtful. And that's it. So there, go ahead and just shit all of your audience, but in a nice way. So to the second... Um, the second type of humor that I want to talk to you about is put down humor, so self deprecating humor. And that's when you're just making jokes about yourself. Um, so, the key with put down humor for self deprecating humor is that you have to show the audience that you're okay with whatever thing it is that you're making fun of. And I think sometimes for me that's very hard because I have a, I'm not obsessed, but I'm slightly like, I really like, 
I want to go to the gym, right? Because I want to lose weight, but I also really like eating. So I want to, I obviously like, I'm not losing any weight and I don't really care, but it's just like, well, if I'm going to the gym all the time, I feel like I should be seeing some sort of result, but also I'm like not on a strict diet. So it's just counterproductive what I'm doing. So I kind of want to make jokes about that because I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, I feel like, um, I feel like when people go on stage and they talk about their weight, they're usually kind of people who are bigger than I am. And I feel like that's okay for them because they're like, well, they're, you know, they're kind of like fatter. So it's funny for them because they're fatter and they can make fat jokes. But if I go on stage, I'm not like that fat. I'm like not fat really. I'm kind of like average size. So sometimes I feel like it would be hard for me to make those kinds of jokes because people would be like, is she just making fun of, fat people like she's not fat she can't do that so I have to find a way to make it um in a way that you know obviously is just about me and not about other people so anyway I have to try to work on that but that's something that I'm trying to work on at the moment um and in the book it says Stephen says like you need to make sure that you're showing that you're okay with whatever thing you're putting down about yourself um and if you show that you're okay then that gives the audience a license to laugh at your problems um, if they feel like you're devastated by whatever your problem is and the audience is not going to laugh at you, they're just going to feel really bad about that. So you have to really make it clear that whatever you're talking about, you're fine with it. You really don't care. So the audience can laugh at it um, with you. So a second thing that's really good about put down humor is that you need to make sure that you um, you find your story and then you, you show the audience that you're okay with it. So um, uh, I'm just reading my notes. Where is my notes? Yes. So um, there's another really famous comedian called Phyllis Diller. She was um, a little bit earlier, I think in the 50s or the 60s. And she, um, she, she was very fine with being the oddball. So she was an oddball. She wasn't hiding it. She was just putting it out there and saying, hey, I don't fit in. Um, these are all the reasons that I don't fit in. And she would list all these reasons about herself, kind of making fun of herself. But she was totally fine with it. And she was like, I don't really care. This, I find it hilarious that, that there's all these things that are wrong with me. And people really like that about her. But the key is that she showed that she was totally fine with um, with being how she was. And she really wasn't going to change anything. So that's just how she was. Um, and then the last type of humor that I want to go through is crowd work, which is something that I really want to improve on because I'm not very good at it. Even though, as I said before, I feel like I'm very good in conversation, um, but just when I'm on stage, uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, translate. And I think one of the problems is, which I've realized, is that I'm probably not doing the crowd work properly. So um, in the crowd work chapter, Stephen says, um, you know, crowd work is part of an MC skill set. So an MC is the person that usually hosts the show. And they, they don't necessarily do material, but they will like do little funny bits in between the acts and then they'll introduce the other comedians. So successful crowd work at the opening of the show can stop the audience from talking amongst themselves and get them focused on the MC. So the conversation moves from the audience to the stage and people have to pay attention to the person in the spotlight when that person is talking directly to them. So crowd work is a good way of like asking people in the audience some questions and then they're focusing from talking to their friends to then talking to you. So that's great. Um, a second key thing of crowd work is when you're asking questions, you want to ask very simple yes, no question. So you don't want to go up there and say something like, do you see the growing criticism of the traditional liberal arts education as a waste of time and money and the rejection of science amongst climate change and the rise of extreme rights in Europe and in the US as coming from a new dark age? Or do you just see it to be a part of the usual course of human events? You know, it's better to ask, so where are you from? You know, just something really simple. Um, and he goes on to talk about these four key elements of crowd work, which I actually found very useful. Um, and I found that I wasn't doing step three, which is the most unnatural thing to do. So basically he says step one is to ask a very simple question, like a yes or no question or something that has a very short answer. And then step two is you have to listen to the reply. And then step three is you have to repeat or paraphrase the answer because you're the only one that has a microphone. And it, it really like, you know, the whole audience is going to be laughing at what you're saying in response to the question but if they don't hear the answer then when you respond to the answer it's not going to be funny so that was what I was doing I wasn't really responding I wasn't repeating the question and therefore when people were listening to me other people they didn't really hear what I asked and then it just sounds like you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and you're not including the rest of the audience so that's something to, to that you need to keep in mind so step three is you have to repeat or paraphrase the answer and then step four is that you have to 
respond to either something in the answer or the way the person says the answer or just something about that person. And that's how you're engaging in the crowd work. Um, and then the last thing he says is that you can actually write crowd work, even though everybody thinks that it's ad-libbed and it's like spontaneous. He says that a lot of crowd work is actually written beforehand and audiences think it's really funny because they assume that it's spontaneous and the person thought of it straight away. But what you do is you, you write out a couple of very simple questions that have very simple answers and then you will go through um, and write responses to each of the answers. So if it's a yes, no answer, you write a response for yes and then you write a response for no. And then when you're on stage, depending on whatever the person says, then you go with that answer. And then everyone's going to think you're hilarious because they think you haven't planned it when in actual fact you have done like a little bit of pre-planning. So they are the topics that I wanted to cover today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to make a video straight after this talking about uh, the comic floor, edgy comedy and character comedy and ad-libbing. And that's going to rule, like that's going to round out the, um, the kind of stand-up types um, or the types of stand-up comedy. And then from there, we're going to just go into like how to write stand-up and how to perform stand-up. And they're the last couple of sections of this book. So I hope that you appreciate this um, video. Let me know in the comments below. I really want to know if you guys have done crowd work, if you like it, if you don't like it. I definitely think it's something that I really want to practice more of. Um, he also says you should do crowd work in the middle of your act so that it's not, you're not coming straight off the bat because sometimes it's hard for people to gauge like your style and if you're not that funny during the crowd work section, which can be because you're not sure what the audience person's going to say, then they might tune out. So make sure that you establish that rapport with the audience first and make sure that they know you're funny, do a couple of jokes, then get into the crowd work and then you can move on to like, you know, closing out your set. So that's all from me. I hope you found it useful. I will see you very soon. Thank you and have a great day. Bye.